Welcome to all of you joining for this afternoon's webinar uh, with Bruce Mayhew, Motivating Teams and Individuals. We'll be underway just after two o'clock. We're just waiting for everyone to join. Um, so we'll be underway shortly. Uh, just a reminder, Monday Bank Holiday in the UK. So we start again on Tuesday, four o'clock, uh, Kirk Bentley. Four o'clock, Kirk's from Seattle. So it's eight in the morning for him next Tuesday on the new battle for the inbox about e-marketing. Uh, for digital events. We've got some pricing with Francesca on Tuesday, Ashman talking all things digital on Thursday, and then Friday, uh, already well in the 200 Club, Hugh Topping uh, talking about what lessons we can learn from the likes of Netflix and Amazon. So that's coming up next week. Uh, we'll be underway in a couple of minutes' time with Bruce Mayhew. Okay, so I can see numbers have started to level out now, uh, people coming in and joining. Uh, welcome to this afternoon's webinar, uh, Motivating Teams and Individuals uh, with Bruce M Mayhew. Uh, Bruce is a bit of a legend, actually, in TPC terms. He was the first ever speaker way back in 2016. He gave our opening keynote at the first ever Tickly Professionals Conference, so it's really good uh, he can join us today, all the way from, I hope, uh, sunny Toronto, uh, for those of you who haven't been on our webinars before, uh, we're going to run, we run a pretty standard, simple format. It will be about 45 to 60 minutes today. Uh, we're recording the session, so kids, dogs, cats, uh, whatever happens that you have to nip away, uh, you can catch it later on from today uh, on demand or on YouTube. Uh, there'll be some presentation by Bruce, and then probably some discussions, some Q&A. And if you haven't used Zoom Q&A on webinar before, it's a button that looks like that and you'll find it at the top or the bottom of your screen. Uh, so a very good morning uh, in, uh, outside of Toronto to Mr. Bruce Mayhew. Bruce, welcome. There you are, Bruce. There we go. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's beautiful here to, in Toronto. It's big, nice big blue skies. Um, I am just looking to find the presentation to share with you. And there we are. Is that there we are. Good? We're underway. Perfect. Um, so I'm really happy to be here. It's great to, to be with such a, a diverse audience. Uh, I've uh, I've looked over the 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 attendance and it's it's amazing uh, people from all kinds of markets and all kinds of businesses and the nice thing about what I'm going to be sharing with you is that it really is applicable pretty much anywhere uh, to any business and to any economy that we're sitting in. Uh, it just so happens that uh, it is even more relevant than ever in sort of a crisis mode uh, that we are paying attention to how we uh, are our leaders, how we how we approach leadership, but also, of course, then how do we motivate our teams and our individuals um, to make sure that we're getting the best out of them and that they're being as adaptive as possible. So what I wanted to quickly do is, is just touch base with what the agenda is going to look like. Um, we're going to just quickly go over 
uh, work and how work has, has changed in the last little bit. Then I'm going to go into sort of the meat of what today's presentation is all about, which is uh, key motivators that, that leaders can use. And then I'm going to be moving into uh, finishing off with how do we actually take those, those, uh, those motivators that I've shared with you and how do we actually share them? How do we, how do we make them happen? And knowing what to do and knowing how to do it are often two very different things. So I wanted to give you a scope on both ends of that, uh, of that equation. So that's roughly um, where I want to go with you. And I'm, I'm trying to make sure that I leave enough time at the end of this presentation for that Q&A, uh, because I, I really think that that, that, will, that will be a really energetic conversation. The presentation that I'm sharing with you is, is, is kind of a combination of three different presentations that I often deliver uh, uh, with a, a core around leadership and a core around communication. So, so this is sort of a, a hodgepodge, basically uh, customized specifically for you. Uh, so, uh, so I think it's going to be a, a really interesting session and I really look forward to the kinds of questions that you might have. Um, so as we move into it, I just want to really set up a foundation for all of us is that we are in a new world in this, in this last few months. And what, if, if we were walking away with anything, we need to walk away with the idea that change is the new normal. That, that everything moving forward is going to be around how do we manage change? Because change is the new normal, change is the new constant, change is the one thing that we can all depend on right now, right? And that's a really important mindset to, to get into our head, is that we actually can start depending on change instead of fearing change, right? And as soon as we start depending on change, our whole relationship becomes very different, right? And it can be very empowering. The challenge is that for the most part, people hate change, right? People like to avoid that, that, that wave that goes along with change. And just, you know, from a, from a human perspective, right, why do we hate change? Uh, we hate change and we like routine because routine, the routine that we experienced a couple months ago, the, the routine that people get into when they get in the car, take the same drive to work, come in the same way, buy the same coffee, blah, blah, blah. We, we like that routine because for us, it lowers uncertainty. It lowers our discomfort in making decisions. Because if we've made the decision yesterday and it turned out well, hey, we get to make the same decision again today and, we don't, and there's less risk for us, both from a corporate perspective, but also as an individual, right? And routine allows us to make successful decision-making, but we have to recognize that that successful decision-making is only in the short term. It is not in the long term, right? The other thing that routine and, uh, 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 does for us, which are negatives, is that it lowers creativity, it lowers market responsiveness, and it lowers employee engagement, especially for the younger generation, right? So anybody that is under 40, um, so in that Gen Z and, uh, and Gen Y millennial range, they actually enjoy the idea around, uh, around change and creativity, and they love work environments that are always adapting because we brought them up to adapt. They're, they've been adapting since they were young children. And to get into a work environment that's static really is frustrating for them. And if anybody's had uh, millennials and Gen Zs that, that, that are coming and working for six months or 18 months and then leaving, one of the challenges that you might be experiencing is that they're not getting the diversity 
that they're hoping for, that they are used to, whether it was at university or at home or wherever it might be. So the thing about routine is that for the long term, it actually hurts our business and it hurts our employee loyalty. And we have to be able to, to recognize that, right? Now, you know, the new world where change is the new normal, right? When we, need, when we take the mind shift and say, we have to walk into the office expecting something to be different. And that's even if we are walking into the office for that matter, right? If we can accept that change is the new normal, then the beauty is that there's all kinds of positive that goes along with that. So for the business, for the team, for the individual, right? It is able to increase the overall responsiveness to, our, to the market. So if we're changing, it means that we're going to be more adaptable, right? We're actually going to be hitting people where they need to be hit. We're touching people where they need to be touched, right? We're giving people what they need, right? In that moment of time, it increases the relevance of the solutions that we find, right? So we're staying up to date. We're increasing creativity and the choices that are available. And that is both, you know, within our customer base, but also when we look at our employee base, we're able to impact our employees in a very different way. So create that creativity and that choice are really beautiful for our customers and for our teams itself, which translates to good for our business. And uh, it increases people's uh, ability to learn, their need to learn, right? So in a change environment, I always have to be on my best. I have to have uh, eyes wide open and I have to be thinking about how do I move forward and stay current, right? And that's very exciting, right? Um, it's a little bit exhausting from time to time, so we need to give people breaks along the line. But having people learn is amazing. Now, the neat thing around that learning adaptability component is that there's been many studies that demonstrate that from an employee base, when we know that our employees are learning, when they feel that they're improving, that their loyalty to us, to the project, to the customer, all go up, right? So that's a really important aspect that we need to be, to be uh, looking at. And we'll be touching more into that in a minute. And then the ability to change when we know that change is the new normal, it increases our need to communicate and to collaborate. And the, there's a there's huge benefit, of course, to uh, communicating and collaborating that we're able to stay in touch with each other. We know that the decisions that we're making are in line with the other uh, decisions that, are, that have been made and that need to be made. So collaboration and communication means usually very few surprises and a lot of alignment. So these are really fantastic things. Now, I'm not gonna get into how to develop this uh, very much in, the, in this program because it's not what, what I was set out to do, right? Uh, but if you want to look at this new world, I would look at, <clears throat> and if you haven't explored already, look into agile project management, right? Because that is really uh, a base that it, I believe is very relevant moving forward on how organizations can work in a very collaborative, but often change environment, change moving forward environment. So look into project, agile project management. Uh, if you're looking for an intro, uh, there's a, a blog post that I wrote a couple months ago, uh, and I'll you know, just do a Google search on introduction to agile project management, Bruce Mayhew, and you'll find it. And that will give you sort of an insight on what Agile looks like. And uh, it's, it, I think it's going to be really important and really beautiful moving forward. So uh, look into that. But again, that's not what today's all about. Today's all about the, the motivation component itself. So there are five areas of motivation for individuals that I want to share with you today. And they, they align perfectly with those, those, five, those five components that I just shared with you. Uh, around 
uh, motivators and and benefits uh, for our for our business, for our employees, for our teams, for our customers. So everything that is good for the external is also good for the internal. So the five motivators that I want to share with you guys from an internal perspective is first purpose. So what is purpose? Purpose is that that what we are working on is important, right? And when people recognize that what they're working on is important, their motivation, their attention to detail, everything goes up, right? It's when we feel like it's just routine, we don't know that it is important, that's when start, motivation starts to wane, right? So from a leader's perspective, we have to be very aware of the purpose that our employees are feeling. The idea around purpose is that it gives our employees pride, right? So they get pride in their work, they get pride in their team's work, they get proud, they're proud of their accomplishments, right? So purpose automatically starts translating into pride, right? And this is really an important aspect that we need to be, make sure that we're paying attention to. Another is impact, right? So not only is it my, my work purposeful, but that it is having an important impact on the department, the team, our customer, the world. Like impact can be in very different ways and it can be in multiple ways at one time, right? So we can have an impact on the environment and an impact on the company and an impact on myself as an employee, as a person. Right? So impact can take very different shapes along the line, right? So the beauty of impact, knowing that the work that I or we do, our effort, my individual effort is important, brings meaning to my work, right? So the fact that I know that I'm making a difference means that what I'm doing is important and I feel that sense of meaning. The third one that I want to talk about is autonomy. It's giving the individual choice of when and or how their work is done, right? Now we're seeing a lot of autonomy now in our economy and in, in our structures at work where people are working from home. And it's really, really interesting that, you know, mid year last year, there were a lot of organizations with the idea that working from home is not possible for our company, right? That no, this team has to work together internally. And that is coast to coast, country to country, all over the place. And I've seen this within every business that I've been able to talk to, that that sort of idea was in place. And with very limited exception, we've now re realized that the idea of where I work and therefore when I work is a lot different than what our expectations were before. And I would say that our idea last year about, no, we have to work together in the office to be collaborative is sort of a legacy mindset from the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, right? It's that older school mentality where if you weren't at work, you couldn't be productive. And I think with the, on, with the idea of technology that we have at our fingertips nowadays, we're demonstrating that, that we can be remote and we can be productive. And I think that this is going to be very important to recognize when everybody goes back to work, how many people are going to want to continue working at least at some point, uh, one or two or three days a week, they're gonna to want to continue working from home. Now, at the same time, there's gonna be a group of people that, are, that can't wait to get back into the office. Uh, so uh, I, I think you're gonna find a, a run on extroverts that are gonna to wanna to get back to the office and a lot of the introverts are going to want to stay at home and continue working uh, at home. That's as long as their families are also leaving the, the, uh, the household. But uh, and the, and it's getting back to the idea of 
autonomy and choice, having some in, some person feeling some personal empowerment is really important in a motivator as a motivator for individuals. Right, that autonomy is provides a feeling of management, that a, a feeling of control. Right, that I'm actually able to control what's going on in front of me at any one time. Competency is key as a motivator, and you're gonna find competency a very strong motivator, especially for that younger generation. So that, <coughs> excuse me, that under 40 generation for the most part, <coughs> excuse me, that uh, the idea that I want to learn new things I want to continue stretching. I want to make sure that I'm adding to my, uh, my CV, if you will, right? It's because I have a future in front of me and I want to make sure that I'm as robust as possible. I want to stay current, right? So competency is a huge motivator for individuals uh, that allows them to feel a sense of pride in their growth. Right, a sense of, of encouragement in them becoming better people. And when they have that abil ability around competency, it translates for them around experience. Right? So they are able to say, yes, I have that experience and I can apply that experience to new situations, which is brilliant because we're in a change environment. Right? And then the last one that I wanna share with you guys is the idea around <clears throat> play and play is one of those those uh, motivators that sometimes we get a little weird about right and we don't recognize the importance of play so the where play comes in and for the most part in an office environment when everybody is together we don't realize how much play is actually going on. So there's like a few jokes that are going around. There's some laughs at somebody spilling their coffee. It could be a birthday. Uh, everybody's singing happy birthday to somebody. It, like, play takes on a huge uh, sort of undercurrent of our human relationships. Now, we have to realize that in some environments, play is actually downplayed, sorry for, sorry for the pun, but by their leader, right? So places that feel like they're buttoned down really tight, that their leader is very serious all the time, that they can't have fun, or in organizations or situations that are 100% stressful all the time, where people are working 14, 15, 16 hour days, six, seven days a week, right? Play starts becoming one of those things that gets, that gets whittled away. And the challenge with that <clears throat> is that without play, without that sense of levity and, 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 uh, and meeting together, we actually downgrade our relationships, right? We, we stop trusting people the same way that we would normally trust people. And we stop, you know, and this is gonna sound a teeny bit weird, but I think all of us can, can understand, we stop doing favors for people. We stop going the extra mile. We stop doing that extra piece of help for somebody, right? And it's the idea of play and relationship building that really lets me lean in to helping you or making sure that my customer is happy, right? So play is a very, very important element that I think we, we talk very little about and perhaps should be talking more about. But play is huge because it develops loyalty, right? And I wanna just bring through a, <clears throat> a little piece around all of these is that while there are five motivators that I think that we all as leaders need to make sure that we're paying attention to, the one thing that I want to make sure that you guys recognize is that it's a sliding scale on these things. So <clears throat> I, you know, as an individual, might 
be really high on my need for autonomy. Meanwhile, <clears throat> my need for competency is quite low. Maybe I really don't feel like I want to master new things, right? And that should be okay for me and for my environment, right? So recognizing what I, what one person needs from a motivation perspective, right, must be different than what the person next door to them who's sitting next door to them or sitting five miles away or five kilometers away <clears throat> needs. So every individual is going to have a different sort of, of uh, needs based on these five things, right? Because you know that there's some people that just, you know, aren't into the playfulness and joking and relationship building. Other people, you, you can't stop them from talking, right? Some people really need to make sure that their work has impact and is seen by other people as having impact. And other people are a little bit more quiet about that idea. All we need to do is look at ourselves and ask ourselves, where on the scope do we fit within all of these five criteria, right? And a nice way to look at this is put, it, put, this, <clears throat> put each of these on a scale of one to six or one to five and say, for me, is purpose high or is it minimum, middle or is it low? Is impact high, middle or low? And as leaders, we need to take that analysis with each of the people that we work with. Right, and we have to be be able to to look at that because what what turns some one person on is not going to turn the other person on. All right, so just quickly, I want to dive into these a little bit deeper. All right, so if one right, I want to look at purpose. Right, so purpose is that my project is important. Right, one of the purpose is actually one of the best engagers for employees. Right, and knowing that when they are, the work that they're working on is important, right? When we know that, typically <clears throat> we see that our employees are more attentive, more loyal, more patient, and more creative, right? So when they, when they recognize that level of purpose, a lot of different things go up. Now, the important thing to recognize is I've given you a list of four, but the benefit list is really long. And it depends on the environment that they're working within, the project that they might be working on, the corporate culture, right, and themselves, right? So knowing what some, why somebody is, uh, needs that level of purpose is unique to that individual and the space that they're working within. So recognize that you have to be able to have that conversation in order to look for that purpose. But know that that purpose is important. I remember in my younger generation, I, I, I used to work for one of the large banks in, in Toronto. And for many years, I had a leader whose purpose, who, who was really clear on what we were trying to do in the purpose of our department. I was in a corporate marketing uh, position. We, uh, that leader, my, that leader uh, got transferred to a different space. I had a new leader and our new leader was very uh, unclear of our purpose. In fact, he would set a purpose for the day. We would be working on a project. We would work on that project. He would take it home and rework all of our work that night, bring it back to be completely different the next day, right? Which continually degraded our sense of accomplishment, of purpose, of, of, of our individual importance in what we were doing. We had no clear vision of what we were working on and why we were working on it. So it was really important that, that from a leader perspective that we really understand that purpose. I can assure you that from a motivation perspective, the whole team dropped in motivation and the turnover over the next two years in that team was almost a hundred percent. So the idea of clear purpose is is uh, is important. Now I want to recognize that in this changing environment, 
that purpose has it, uh, purpose is able to change, right? What we are working on has to be adaptable, but that adaptability has to be consistent all the way through. So the vision for the organization can become the purpose, right? The values of the organization can become the purpose. And those are two very powerful things to be able to hang on to the business as we're moving through a changing environment, right? Because in a change environment, if we're not, if we don't hang on to something, it can feel very dislocated, right? So think of purpose as one of your main co components and think purpose as the vision and the goals of the organization or the team and the purpose being the values of the organization. So really important things to anchor why everybody is coming to work every day, whether they're working remotely or, or together uh, in, a, in an office environment. Motivation number two, the impact that, uh, that we discussed earlier. Impact is important because it justifies that person's effort, right? Why am I coming to work? That at the end of the day, I've made a difference. And that translates to I've made a difference with this project, or it could go even broader to I have made the right decision to be in this career, to be working at this company, right? So having impact is critical, right? In being able to, to lean into their work every day, right? People need to know that what they're doing is making a difference. For my boss, that the, the, the new boss that I had, him going home and redoing all of our work and then coming back the next day, basically dismantled any pride in impact that any of us had. And because he did that all the time, we actually stopped putting much effort into the work that we did do because we knew that he was going to change it, right? And as I said a minute ago, uh, loyalty within the department went right out, right? And uh, almost 100% uh, turnover within two years. So really impactful uh, that, that people know that what they're doing is making a difference, right? In the end, we all want to know that we've contributed, that we've done something to the world around us, right? The third one that I uh, want to talk about that we have talked about is autonomy, right? And if we always feel that everything that we do is going to be double checked, triple checked and changed, right? Or that I don't have control. If I'm three minutes late walking into the office and somebody's raising an eyebrow or that, you know, my, uh, you know, my break is exactly 15 minutes or that I have to do this work at this time, if I don't have choice, I feel like an automaton, right? I don't feel like I'm actually able to think on my own. So allowing people the ability to choose, right, I'll, helps people feel a sense of pride and ownership of what they do, right, and when they do it, right? It, it allows them to feel pride in doing their best work when they are at their best, right? It gives that sense of control, right? That makes people feel happy, right? Committed, productive, because I'm able to work when I'm at my best, and loyal, right? So that idea of, of I'm, I'm cherished enough, that I'm trusted enough, to do what I'm supposed to do and make sure that I get it done in the right amount of time really re elevates an individual's pride and commitment to their work, right? And I, and, and I think all of us can understand that when we took, take a look at ourselves, right? When we look at what we each need from a, an, an autonomy perspective, what does that make you feel? Right? When, when you have that sense of control over what you do and when you do it. 
Now, it's important that from an organizational perspective, that managing expectations is really clear, right? That we have to make sure that people know what the goals are and what the due dates are, but then to give them some, some freedom in order to manage around that, right? So uh, anyone who wants autonomy must also know that autonomy is not a, a locked down thing, that in a change environment where things might get really heated all of a sudden, that we need all hands on deck, that autonomy might actually need to take a back seat to getting the project done, right? That we might actually need everybody to come into the office for one week to work on this special project if working from home is one of our normal things, right? Or that you might normally work in, not work in the mornings because uh, that's, uh, that's not when you're at your best, but because of a project, I might need all hands on deck for a morning for a week. So the idea around autonomy is that we all must know that it is something that needs to ebb and flow within our corporate culture. And then motivation for competency, <clears throat> right? Uh, we have to make sure that we're learning new things. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be really important uh, for your younger generation, that people love to know that they're learning new things, right? They want to know that they're adding to their CV, that they're growing, and that they are becoming, uh, that they're, that they're uh, gaining new experiences that they can apply to new situations, right? So that growth and competency is really important. Um, when employees are remote, and this is really an important thing that we as leaders need to recognize, when employees are remote, skills development often um, becomes uh, uh, fewer and far between, but more important, right? So let me just bring that together a little bit. When people are remote, it's easy for us as leaders, as organizations, to forget that we need to do that competency component for our, our employees, right? Because it's not in front of us, it is easy for us to forget that that is necessary, right? But when employees are remote, it is one of the skills that often increases in importance. Because people are working from home, they need to feel different things, right? They need to feel that they're not just sitting at home by themselves static, that skills development is, is critical, right? So it's one of those things that easy to forget, exactly one of the things that you don't want to forget. So uh, recognize that there's, those are very different. If anybody is familiar with uh, Stephen Covey, uh, Stephen Covey, seven, uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the habits of, of most effective people, uh, sharpen the saw is what Stephen Covey calls this whole idea around competency and learning new skills. So anybody familiar with, with uh, those traits will understand what sharpen the saw means. Okay. And then the last motivation, the one we, we don't talk a lot about, is that play. And like I said earlier, play is important because it really helps uh, break down barriers, it builds relationship, and builds trust. It is one of the things that are fundamental to humans, that we need to have some levity, some, some feeling of, of happiness in our lives. And it should exist at work. We should be able to bring our whole selves to work and have some fun, have some laughs uh, while we're at work. The beauty is that uh, a good laugh actually decreases a stressful situation in amazing ways, right? So uh, play, uh, especially if you're experiencing uh, a lot of stress at work, take some time to have some fun. And we can do this remotely, we can do this over Zoom, the same way that we can do it uh, when we're in a, in a person to person environment, right? So make sure that, uh, that you're always having some fun and, and engaging people in a very different way other than just work, 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 right? An all work and no play office culture has many downsides. And uh, uh, 
and a playful environment has many upsides. One of the downsides to a all work, no play is that, that uh, uh, health uh, decreases overall, uh, absenteeism goes up, healthcare costs go up, loyalty goes down, right? And this is all simply a result of a no play or a play environment. So recognize when you can throw a little bit of a game into a Zoom meeting or, or uh, allow yourself to laugh at something that has just happened, right? Um, it is important that, that we play into that, right? Uh, I, I just really want to go quickly over this next slide because it really talks about how us as leaders need to change, right? Because everything that I've shared with you so far is around uh, key, key levels of motivators, right? Key motivators right, that we need to be paying attention to. But, but for most leaders, we actually aren't used to having to ever think that way, right? So we have to recognize that the best leader, every great leader, has two sides of, our, of ourselves. One is the boss and one is the advisor, the coach, the mentor, right? Historically, we have been the boss, right? The best leaders have been the boss, where, uh, where about 70% of their effort was all about being that making decisions, making sure that people were where they should be at the right time. It, it was a level of control, right? So 70% was all about control, right? Things that were promoted in that controlled leader was drive, courage, accountability. So this is what, uh, what that leader was rewarded on. These are the things that the leaders expected from their employees, right? But Fast forward to today, where we recognize that actually it's flipped and about 65 to 80% of a leader's responsibilities are soft skills, right? And the things that make that leader successful are things like humility, humanity, temperance, and collaboration, right? And so we have to recognize in ourselves how much of our leadership quality is boss and how much of our leadership quality is about being a, an advisor and a coach right and if you don't think that your current leadership style <clears throat> is is weighing higher on the humility side it simply means that we have to be a little bit more reflective on how we approach the work that we're doing right and this isn't a session about that so I, I actually hesitated to put this slide in because I don't want to get into that conversation uh, unless you want to do it in the Q&A section. But, but I actually think it's important that as leaders that we self-reflect on what are our strengths and what are the things that we bring to the table every day. And if <clears throat> your style isn't around temperance and collaboration and humility about being a coach, being an advisor, bringing out the best in people, right? You're going to have, be a less effective than the leader who does bring those things out. The leader that brings those things out are going to be able to effectively deal with those five motivators that I just shared with you, right? So take a little bit of time from a self-reflection perspective and move forward. Now, <clears throat> I want to leave off with one last thing about how do we actually make this work, right? So how do we actually take those made of motivators and make them real for an employee in a real work environment? And it, there's, it, this is a really interesting exercise to go through. We, when we're giving people praise, when we're trying to inspire and motivate them, focus on the individual's specific effort that they're making, right? and be very specific on what that effort is. So as an example, if you're going to reward somebody for work that they've done that you thought was great, you want to say things like, your hard work made a difference, right? So you're specifically focusing on the effort of their hard work versus you are great or you were great, right? Because you were great doesn't point to something that they were great at. 
So when you're giving somebody praise, point to the effort, right? Your research paid off versus you are smart. And if you're at home with your kids, you can say things like, the colors you chose, right? I like the colors you chose versus you are so creative. So if you want to people to repeat the behavior that you've seen, be specific on rewarding exactly that behavior, right? Again, focusing on the specific is you shared an important suggestion around enrollment versus thanks for attending the meeting. You stayed cool and focused during that difficult conversation versus you have a knack for difficult conversations. And if you're talking to your kids, you were kind helping your, our neighbor with her trash versus you are kind. So in all of these elements, whether it's you're taking out trash, right, making suggestions for enrollment, right, doing uh, research, always point to the thing that you're actually trying to reward, right? Because if you just say, hey, you were great, man, you're a fantastic, wow, you're beautiful, right, whatever it might be, you're giving people a false sense of that pride, right, of that motivator, right? So make sure that we are always focusing on that motivator itself, right? So that's where I want to leave it with you guys. And I'm really open to any types of conversation that you want to have around this, uh, whether it's about working from home, whether it's about your leadership styles. If you want me to go back to any specific slide, happy to do that. Um, but I want to open it up to you guys and, uh, and see what's on your minds. Thank you very much, Bruce. I'll just take back control that famous phrase there we go um questions for bruce we've got one in bruce that came in uh from louise i'm not sure if louise is still with us uh kind of more of a comment that, that, than, a, than a than a question she says, I, she says i think it's a real mistake to say that competency is only motivated for under 40s. Good employees continue to learn and gain experience lifelong. Ignoring that is leaving out value, leaving out value of people or some people in the workforce. Interesting comment from Louise there. I've got one for you, Bruce, while people want to get down, find that Q&A button and, and, uh, and, and put the questions in there for you. Um, I see a lot of memes on, on social media, you know, of people rolling their eyes, which is, when that 40 minute Zoom call could have been a, a quick phone call. And any, any ideas about Slack versus Zoom versus phone versus email? Because there's so many ways to communicate now. Whereas I'd normally stand up and look over the, your, your cubicle and, and say, good job on that customer service issue, Bruce. How, how about mentioning that? How about those different ways that we now have to communicate with our teams? Sure. So, uh, so what I'm hearing from you is, is in, in a work environment where people are, are working remotely, right? How, how do we effectively communicate using all of those different channels that we were, that we're uh, familiar with? Um, being email, uh, phone, uh, uh, Zoom, uh, whatever it might be. And, it, and it's really, in, it's a great question, actually, because the way that we've used all of those different communication protocols in the past and I go back like a few months ago, uh, is actually changing in order for us to be very, a, a lot more effective in a, uh, in a work environment. So clearly we all recognize that, that, that Zoom, that video conferencing uh, is, is very different now than it used to be, right? We, uh, this has taken over for uh, the, the standard meeting kind of environment. And it's a really important environment because when, when a team or two people are on a, uh, a Zoom chat, a, uh, this type of a conversation, then it allows us to, to see hand gestures. It allows us to, to reach out to a, and know that there's actually a human being there. And it's really important because if, if we're in a meeting face-to-face, uh, -face, you can see when I'm confused or puzzled or might have a question uh, or might be inspired by something. 
Uh, so the Zoom environment is really important. I mean, you have to make sure that from a team perspective, uh, that we that we are embracing that 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 Zoom environment, that 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 video environment. But uh, the one thing that has really become really interesting, because to your point, you can't holler over the partition anymore, which actually is a really important element of uh, communication and leadership and, 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 and uh, collaboration within the team. And uh, so we have to find the, tra the translation of standing up and hollering over the partition. And that's where our phones are actually uh, taking on a new life. And we have to be able to see that, that our phone is actually the best place for a good question, right? That, uh, not I am, because I am, I, I love I am, uh, I love instant message, but there, it can, I am can come across as very abrupt, right? Especially if, hey, is that done? Uh, can actually be, hmm, uh, what do you mean by that? As opposed to, it might actually be a question about, hey, is that done yet? So I can do my stuff, right? So it might be just a simple question, but through an I am environment, it might come across as a little harsh, which impacts our relationship. Um, we have to be able, we have to be able to pick up the phone and allow ourselves to have a quick 30 second conversation, right? Not do all the niceties of, oh, it's a blue sky and oh, how are you doing? And I, we have to be able to use our phone now as a stand up holler over the screen, which means our perspective on how we use our phones is going to have to change because a lot of people have got used to never answering these things, right? And we have to recognize that within our team, when we see one of our team calling, that we do pick up. So it's a culture shift around how we embrace our phone with our team, right? And allow ourselves to pick up the phone, have a 30 second, hey, did you do that? What about this? Did you, is that a good? Yeah, okay, fine, thank, bye, click. And it's, 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 it's short, it's abrupt, but it allows us to hear our voice, right? And allows us to be able to explore certain situations. Use I am very similar to what you've always used I am for. Use email in a very similar way that you've always used I am or email before, but use video and phone in a slightly different perspective than you've used before. And we're seeing that uh, organizations that are, that are really embracing this remote culture are being very, and uh, intentional about helping everybody on the team embrace things the same way. Does that, that answer your question, Andrew? Yeah, that, that, that does. That's fantastic. Thank you. Uh, we've got six questions now in the Q&A. So uh, those of you on the webinar, if you want to head into the Q&A, you might want to give a thumbs up to questions that are already there that are particularly relevant to you. You can use, we have enabled the anonymous uh, feature on this one. So if you don't want to say kind of who you are, where you're from, because this is a sensitive issue to some people. But one person, Rachel, has asked, uh, she says, you didn't mention money. Do you think that it's a motivator and makes a difference? Do people put up with more when they are paid more? Asks Rachel. Uh, uh, there are a few people that fall into the yes category on that one. Uh, but for the most part, uh, motivator is a terrible, money is a terrible motivator, right? Um, so for the most part, if, if first of all, everybody has to be paid what they should be paid, right? And, and as long as you and I are paid sort of the same kind of range for whether we're at this company or that company or this department or that department, as long as I believe that you and I are on a somewhat equal playing field, then mo money, is, uh, money is usually not much of an issue. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, if I feel like I'm being paid 20% less, then my motivation is going to be a lot lower. For the most people in the world, if I think that I'm being paid 20% more, I'm actually not going to be that much more motivated, right, than, than the person who, who is, is, uh, is down from us. One of the things, so, so for the most part, money is not a great motivator. Look to intrinsic, not extrinsic motivators when you're really looking to engage team environment 
and really raise up productivity. If you throw somebody a couple extra dollars, even think about yourself, if you ever had a bonus, if, if bonuses is something that, that is good for you, uh, you get the bonus, then you go out and buy a big screen TV or whatever you do with it. And then six or six weeks later, you're not even thinking about what is going to inspire you for the next 10 months, right? But if you feel pride in what you do, if you feel like what you're doing is, is, is accomplishing something that you're, that you're, that you are becoming a better person or your company is becoming a better company or you're, you're doing something really amazing, for your customers, if you have a sense of pride, that pride will push you forward for the, like, as long as it continues to be motivated uh, through that the whole year. And the beauty of that is that it costs nothing for that leader who is driving intrinsic motivators. So I hope that answers your question. Superb, superb. Thanks for that question, Rachel. There's one that's caught my eye here. We've got seven in the, in the, in the feed. So uh, people, you might want to give a, uh, if I press the right button so people could vote on them, which I hadn't done, apologies, which I've now enabled, just realized that you can give a thumbs up to other questions that are there. But this one caught my eye, Bruce. It says, uh, again, anonymous, how can we help motivate our manager who may be struggling with work demand. So flipping it around and motivating up rather than motivating our teams beneath us. Yeah, it's, it, and that's where, like, and I didn't go into that realm uh, specifically here, but it is certainly, um, there's sort of two components to that. Um, one is how do you deal with your existing manager? And second is how do you make sure that your next manager is, is, uh, is thinking along this side of, intrinsic motivators right um so really creating a for the for the manager that exists it really does talk about um creating a culture in that environment in, in that department that that deals with uh this kind of environment so you have to be very intentional right so having conversations about um, uh, uh, about uh, the benefit of all of this and trying to bring them along, right, the process into becoming more of an intrinsic motivator and, and less of a, a extrinsic motivator or not a motivator at all, right? It is, it is a journey, right? It is not a quick fix. I will give you this, right? If, if, you're, if that management... If that manager has been rewarded all along for drive and accountability and not around creating a sense of a motivating team and inspiring environment, that individual needs to actually shift themselves in the way that they think and the way that they bring themselves forward because their whole career might be being based on them being rewarded in a very different way or them rewarding others in a very different way. Um, best ways to do that, like I said, create, start creating a culture around this type of motivation, which means that you have to have conversations around this. You have to talk about the values of the organization, right? And if the values of the organization are uh, employee care, employee um, trust, if transparency, right? So looking at what they do right, their behaviors, how they motivate their team, and bringing it back to the values of the organization. The other thing that you can do is start developing their learning process around this. So give them articles that talk about motivation in different ways. Give them articles about ge how different generations are motivated by different things. Um, talk to them about intrinsic. Give them books to read around intrinsic. Send them on training workshops, right? It is not a quick fix. It is a migration, right? That that needs to be uh, that 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 needs to be set out for this individual. But you have to be intentional with them as well. Sitting down and rec with them and saying, you know, guys, um, things are changing in this in this world. And the nice thing about if there's anything good about what we're experiencing right now, it is that everything is changing. So we can have that conversations with saying like, 
wow, our world is changing. How are we going to make sure that this world is different moving forward for us? How do we motivate our people differently knowing that money is a terrible motivator, right? How do we need to change our behavior in order to move forward? And then talk to them about how, what they might need to do along the way. So I, I, I'm not sure if I rambled or if I have No, to... no, 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 I think that, that, that's, that's good. I've got a couple, on, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come on to something of fun in a minute. We've got a couple yeah. of questions on fun, and it's fun in inverted commas. Um, but I wanna touch on one, and I'm gonna come on to about the situation we find ourselves in now, which is staff who've been placed on leave or redundancy who lost their jobs as well. But yeah. just, just following up, there's another one that's following up about going up the management chain. And it asked, how can, it, a quick answer on this one, how can we encourage higher management to ensure praise is given fairly and not just the same people every time? Yeah, it's... Um, that's demotivating. If you, you know, you get getting praise and I don't, yeah. and we work on the same campaign, how do I go to our boss? Hey, can you stop uh, saying well done Bruce all the time? Right, and, it, and that's something that the leaders simply need to be very aware of, right? Um, that that they that they are making that they're uh, sharing praise uh, where it is most warranted, and not always in one basket. Now, this is also it's also important to recognize here is what are the motivators for each individual, right? Because and it gets back to the, like think about what those those top those motivators are. I might be I might be motivated by autonomy. You're not, right? So rec you have to also recognize who's motivated by what and to, to reward on those things. Because just making, giving everybody the same type of praise isn't going to work. So I might be really uh, um, discouraged because I'm high on competency, right? But you're giving everybody else competency and they don't care about it, right? So we, being really attentive to what you're praising on is 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 important but okay. but leaders have to be very aware they have to be able to tap into that okay we're going to talk about fun in a second and then about staff that that are that are you know on furlough or leave or or, or paid you know unemployment i want to go to the bottom of the park there's one that's caught my eye here along with some compliments uh on a great session bruce thank you very much uh, any tips for moti motivating yourself as a manager it can be hard to motivate others when you have no motivation yourself? Very nice one. What do you think on that, Bruce? Yeah, uh, and that, that's a great question. Because, um, and because um, it, 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 it's a lot of work to be a leader because you have to have your spidey senses on all the time, right? Um, find out, first look internally, look, look to yourself and ask yourself out of these motivators, what is the thing that is most important to you? What are the, like, where, where, where are your top two, right? And where are your bottom two, right? What's important to you? And know what that is. And then look at self-care, right? And this, everybody needs self-care. But think about self-care for yourself. And what do you need to, to, to make sure that you're in the right place, right? Now, and this gets back to, to, are you an introvert or are you an extrovert, right? If you, if you are an introvert, and, and, but still a leader, that's a really interesting place to be because you have to be out there all the time. But at the same time, you need to be able to protect yourself, right? And give yourself time to recharge. So make sure you're doing the things that allow yourself to recharge. But when you're in, when you're on, make sure you're on 100%. Now, one of the best things that I've ever uh, learned, and I share this with every individual that I coach and almost every training session that I deliver, is that one of the best things that we as leaders can do is have 10 minute meetings with each employee once every week, once every two weeks, right? And just give yourself that, that narrow 10 minute, 15 minute window where you get to know each other, where you get to talk about the projects and get to know what's important for that individual, right? Having those, those 10 minute meetings makes 
the time that you do spend being a leader, being a motivator, very effective because you know, you learn what is most important to Bruce or what is most important to Andrew, right? And so when you are on, you are dead, you are dead effective, right? When you are talking about your, the values of the organization to the team, you are dead effective, right? And when you are able to sit back and relax and close your door or not answer the phone for five hours because you just need that space, you have that and you don't feel guilty about it. So um, really think about self-care and make sure that when you're on, you're on and you're effective. So Great. We've got, we've got five questions, which I'm going to summarize into two. Uh, okay. We're going to talk about specific of the entertainment industry in a second. The, the first one's about fun, and there's two questions here. First is how can you encourage fun <clears throat> when a team member is against it? Uh, and then coupled with that, about the sense of fun, how do we avoid falling into the trap of, inverted commas, organized fun at work? Something team members roll their eyes at feeling that they could have had time to finish that email, that project, rather than engaging in that fun. So how do we have that nice kind of barrier between fun and work? Right. Uh, and fun has to be the thing that, um, that people aren't forced into, but just happens. Right. Um, so, uh, and, and I, I get it. Uh, we have to be really careful with that fun thing. Cause I, I'm an introvert for the most part. I love getting on stage. I love being able to share like this kind of stuff, but for the most part, I'm an introvert. So when, when organized fun comes along, I'm one of the first people that want to sit back. So I get it. Um, so make it more of an invitation than anything else, right? So make it something that people are invited to. Um, so, and I think in this world, I, I'm thinking from a remote perspective. So once a week on our Zoom calls, I would say, you know what? Let's talk about what's the funniest or the, the funniest thing that you ate last week, or what's the best recipe that you've discovered new since working from home, right? Uh, wh what, what did you do that you laughed at of yourself, right? And some people are gonna go, yeah, I, nothing I can think of or whatever. And, and allow it to, to, to go over. But you'd be amazed that uh, when I start talking about the, the, the recipe that I, cre that I found and where I found it, that in itself is fun, it's levity, right? Um, fun doesn't have to be the raw, raw, j jokey, laughy thing, right? Uh, it can be anything that's not work, right? So it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, who's going to give themselves a haircut this weekend, right? And what are your, what do you fear about, about your haircut? Uh, or, you know, you can say, you know, we're going to do a, a purple day today. Right, so everybody's going to dress purple. So when we're on video calls, everybody's wearing purple. Fun doesn't have to be complicated. Fun can be just really light and and relaxing. And that's the kind of stuff that I would say you want to bring to your work environment. Um, and, and if you're back in the office, do the same kind of thing. It's today's jeans day. Tomorrow's purple day. Uh, everybody's going to bring in cookies next Friday. I don't care if you bake them or not. Uh, but it's Cookie Friday. Fun can be in a lot of different ways. And I, don't, don't make it a party, right? Because people like me are not going to want to be part of the party. Okay, okay. Uh, now, thank you very much for that. I want to turn on to, we've got three questions here specifically about the situation we find ourselves in now. And I know you've done a lot of work. I've seen you at the International Ticket Association. I've seen you at Opta in Canada as well. So I've got three questions here, which I'm going to read to try and, and then put together, which is um, a lot of managers on here have got staff on what we call the UK furlough. So that's kind of uh, subsidized unemployment really being pushed away from the organization. So what tips can we motivate with them? Cause they're not part of the, the activity we're doing now. Couple with that, I'm a manager of a front of house in a theater. My staff get motivation from the interaction with customers on a daily basis. How, when we're taking that away from them because we're closed, how do I keep them kind of motivated? Mm. And also any specific tips on t uh, for motivating teams that have stuff with redundancy. So you and I work together, I've been canned, 
or, or maybe redundant, you know, we were best buddies, you're feeling down to not work anymore, probably. Uh, so, you know, how do I keep you motivated when you've lost people on your team? So there's, a, there's about three questions in there about our current situation. Okay, I, I'm going to answer the first one and then try to get a little bit more information. I, I don't know if that's possible around what the, the, the other two might look like, because the other two are a little bit more complicated because they're specific uh, to, uh, to, a, to an industry or to a, to a specific job. So usually answering those two questions, I, I usually look for a little bit more understanding around that, but let me see what I can do with it. For the furloughed uh, group, um, there's actually a lot of I think there's a, a lot of things that we can we can encourage that group to, uh, to 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 stay motivated and stay inspired because you're right. Uh, being furloughed uh, is is tough. Uh, being furloughed, you know, some people. Someone said to me the other day, it's like, oh, they get to they get paid to to stay home and sleep in. And I'm like, well, you know what? Being furloughed is right up there with being laid off. Right? Even though you know you're going back there's this, there's a sense of, oh, I wasn't worth keeping, right? Uh, and, and you know that the economy is different, but there, that little mm, behind you, that, that person that talks all that nasty stuff is still sitting behind you talking about that. You have to make sure that they're, that they, that they know that they're a valuable, that they're staff, that they're valuable, right? Um, then ask them or give them opportunities around self-care. Let them know that their job right now is self-care, right? And self-care for that individual can take on a lot of different things. So somebody who's really athletic might start training for a half marathon and that's their self mental self-care. Self-care um, self -care might be decluttering their house. Self-care might be taking a nap in the afternoon. Um, but one of the things that you want to encourage is that they stay connected with other people outside of their four walls, right? So uh, it, if it's possible, invite them in to meetings, right? If, so if you're doing broad weekly meetings, update meetings, is it possible to invite them in? right? To help them stay current with what's going on in the market, right? Or maybe set up a weekly meeting with just you from a management perspective and everybody who is furloughed, right? And bring them up to speed with what's going on with your industry, right? So help them come forward. Invite them into this meeting. Maybe not all of them will attend. Maybe not all of them will attend every meeting, but help them stay current with what's going on so that when they do come back, that they're not five miles down the road or 5K down the road. Uh, so do that. One of the other thoughts that I, that I have had around this, um, because I have talked a little bit about this, is, is um, I've seen the furloughed group, right, from different industries. And you guys are, are, are a great industry if, if, it, if you're all connected at some point. But the furloughed group actually create a meeting environment among themselves so that they all talk about what they're going through, what's going on in, in their work life, what they're doing to stay uh, effective, what they're, stay, what, they're, what they're doing to pass the time. Uh, they laugh at each other. They laugh at their pajamas, whatever it might be. But they have actually created an independent group of their own that are having this unique furloughed experience, right? So I, you know, I think there's tons of situations out there. Certainly, again, recap, make sure that they're taking care of themselves, that they're allowing themselves time to grieve and, and learn. But then I would say, ask them, what do you need in order to feel like you're staying current? And when you come back, that you are hitting the road running, right? Um, so there's elements within that I, th I think you can work on. Okay, we're gonna have to, we, 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 I'm gonna have to go to these last bunch of questions and I have to kind of wrap those up. Yep. Um, which is basically, um, there's three quick ones here, so, so quick answers on these ones. Uh, how can you turn a manager's negative opinion about you around? How do you advise 
or you know communicating your motivator to your manager um and is it possible to, to, to encourage motivation when the passion is gone? When um, I've checked out, I'm, I'm you know. Yeah, um, I, I, how do you change a manager's negative opinion of yourself? Uh, I, you know, it, that's a, it's, a, it's gonna be an uncomfortable space for you perhaps. Um, one of the things that you could do is, <clears throat> excuse me, have that, one-on-one -on -one conversation where, you know, Andrew, I don't feel that, uh, that I'm coming across it, it as my, in my best window in your eyes. I feel like I'm doing a great job. I'm not getting a sense that Andrew, that you're seeing that. Is there places that you think that I need to work on or, you know, that kind of uh, environment? You might want to have that conversation. Uh, if you're a little bit uncomfortable with that, uh, perhaps go to, I, I love going back to what are the department goals? What are the department values? Like what are the organization goals? What are the organization values, right? I believe that the best culture for a team or for a, uh, an organization are always rooted in those values. So I would look back to what you know, those values are for your company, for your team, right? Which should be the same. <laughs> um, what are those values? And are you living those values? So maybe do a little bit of self-reflection because it might be that you're not actually living up to the same expectations that your boss has, right? So your expectations might be over here and you might be doing a great job of it. Right? But your boss's expectations based on the organizational goals and values are over here. Right? Well, looking at those goals and values might help you come more into alignment of what that, that your, your boss is looking for. Because you might be out of alignment and not even realize it. Right? So it's not always necessarily you, but I would check in and make sure that you are in alignment with those values and goals and living those values and goals all the time. And then look to those motivators that I talked earlier and motivate yourself around uh, your competency, around your mastery, around your, your autonomy, and, 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 and help move that needle within yourself. And that should open up that vision. But at, at some point, you might simply need to have that conversation with, with your manager. I, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what the third question was. Okay. Um, yeah. It's how you t how you turn the managers uh, negatively about around you. Just did that one. Um, and is it possible to encourage motivation once the passion for the job is gone? Um, yes and no. Um, there are some people that when uh, when their passion is gone, their passion is gone, right? And some people have checked out and and don't ever want to come back. Like so, it's not that their passion is gone. They just don't want to be there. Um, so there are those people that are, that are going to exist, right? And there's no getting around those people. You can't light a fire under, uh, with wet wood. So, so you know, there's, there's some people you can't do that to. But for somebody who, who does want to do good, but has simply been, uh, feels like they've not ever been motivated right or they've not been appreciated, simply going in and, and, and start, maybe not have a conversation with them because they might feel a little wounded. Um, they might feel a little vulnerable, uh, but go in and just slowly give them things to work on and make sure that you're paying attention to, to praising them. So that, that, I think is the last slide that I shared around, uh, around giving them verbal praise uh, that is sincere, that is real, right? Don't don't give them stuff that, that makes it look like you're throwing sunshine up certain areas. Um, just be really real with them and s slowly start to build up their own sense of, of, of pride and commitment again. That might work, right? Um, when, you, when they feel a little bit less vulnerable, uh, you might be able to then have the conversation going, hey, Bruce, like, you know, you've, I, I've, I've really seen you do a couple great things in the last couple of weeks. I'm really impressed with that. Tell me, what do you want to see? Where do you want to be in the next three months? Is there a project going on here that you want to be part of? 
right? Um, ask them what they see on the radar that they might want to do, right? And it's amazing what can happen when they choose what to do. Uh, what to do. Uh, if, if you have time, um, I'm, I'm chair of a board for a not-for-profit. When I took over for the not, as, as chair last fall, I simply said uh, to each of the members of the group, I said, I want to know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with you about what are your priorities? Where do you see us as a group going over the next year? What do you think our accomplishments can be? I had this huge list, like huge list of accomplishments that they came back with, like when I, when I, uh, uh, I put it all together. But that allowed me to then turn it and say, hey, Andrew, this was one of the things that you want us to go on. How about you taking that on as a project, right? And now, because they brought it to us and I turned it around and said, here's a, here's a special project that you're gonna be able to take and, and be your own. I, am, I have one of the most active boards that I could even imagine. And, and they're volunteer, they're not paid, but they are doing amazing things just because I asked them what they saw was going to be important in our environment. So letting people choose, huge, huge motivator. Superb, superb. Well, thanks, Bruce. We've run way over. Uh, still got a lot of people with us, but thank you very, very much for getting up early and caffeinating uh, <laughs> give us this UK afternoon session. Uh, folks can follow you on Twitter and and. Uh, anyone who said they'd share details with you, I take it hopefully you'll be in touch with in the weeks ahead. Um, thank you all uh, for staying with us. Just a reminder that Monday, Kirk Bentley from Wordfly is uh, doing some email mastery. We've got some pricing, some digital, um, and then looking outside our industry next Friday from Hugh Topping at Crown Engage. All that remains is to thank uh, Bruce. Bruce, thank you. It's been absolutely superb. One of the most engaging one. And uh, well done, much appreciated. Thank you both. My uh, some good comments coming in on Q&A from Liam and Carol. Thank you for those. Uh, everyone else, thank you very much. If you're in the UK, enjoy your bank holiday weekend and we will see you all very soon. Have a nice beer. I can't have a beer for another couple hours, so I hope everybody has a drink this afternoon for me. It's Friday, of course you can, Bruce. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone.